Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tikva's special briefing with our chairman, Elliot Abrams, on Israel's conduct of the war, regional security, the U.S.-Israel relationship, and the return of a very public sort of discussion about the two-state solution. My name is Jonathan Silver. I'm the Warren R. Stern Senior Fellow of Jewish Civilization at Tikva and the editor of Mosaic. And our guest, of course, is Elliot Abrams, our chairman, chairman of the Vandenberg Coalition, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a distinguished public servant working in the legislative and executive branches of the U.S. government at the highest levels. Elliot, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure, John. Thank you. Elliot, we last convened in a forum like this one to discuss Israel's war against Hamas on October 9th, mm -hmm. just days after the massacre in the Western Negev and in the Gaza envelope. There was a lot of uncertainty then about the nature of the Israeli response, about the potential for regional action and reaction throughout the Middle East, about the reactions of American and European officials and international institutions. On October 9th, moreover, we did not yet know the extent of the front that was then opening on American campuses and in the American public square. We know a lot more now. So just to begin our conversation on the ground in Gaza, where would you say the IDF is in its operations? How would you assess how they've done over the last 139 days? I think they've done quite well, though it has taken a little bit longer than it initially anticipated. Um, in my initial conversations in October and November, they were talking about being able to do this by the end of February. And I think they're now talking more about the end of March, this being the major combat operations. Um, I think uh, one has to be careful in talking about numbers, uh, partly because the Palestinian numbers are all coming from Hamas. So one assumes there are lies. Um, on the Israeli side, the number of people who have died in combat is terrible, but um, it probably couldn't have been predicted to be much lower uh, in the kind of urban warfare that they've been engaged in. And they've done what the IDF is very good at, which is <clears throat> innovate, innovate in combat, figure out, okay, if the tunnels are twice as large, how do you, uh, how do you go into them? How do you close them off without losing scores and scores of IDF soldiers you know, using high tech um, approaches? They've been doing as they usually do. They've been learning on the job, let's say, um, on doing that. And they've been doing all of this under constraints that are imposed partly by their own code of morality. That is the effort to avoid civilian casualties um, and outside pressure, including US pressure as well. The, the initial tactical you know, the field of battle uh, that Israel drew up seemed to rely in those very first uh, operational moments on very heavy airstrikes, followed then by ground incursion that sort of entered uh, from the east into Gaza and sort of split the Gaza Strip in two, then going north and now going south. W would you say, what, what what stage is that operation in right now? How close do you think they are, they are to concluding this major round of operations before going to the next step. And what's the next step? The next step is Rafa. Um, Rafa, that is to say, the location on the Egyptian border. Uh, and why does one have to do that? Because there's a concentration of Hamas forces there, including Hamas forces that were originally there and others who have fled from the north and center of Gaza. Um, the high command is almost certainly there. Um, tunnels to Egypt are there. And if one is looking at the future of Gaza, how do, how do you stop this from happening again? How do you stop the influx of Iranian weaponry? That border has to be closed off. And uh, they will no doubt, the Israelis will no doubt work with the Egyptians on this, but they need to have some kind of presence on the border as well. So I think that is the next step. Um, it's a very hard step to take because of the concentration of civilians. Makes it impossible to do the kind of um, activity, the kind of combat they did in the North, because the population is even denser than it was to begin with. Uh, they talk about another month or so to do that. <laughs> 
And then there's this question of what comes after this phase of combat operations comes to a close. Um, the 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 final uh, final settlement of what happens in Gaza is sort of hard to know at the moment, but inevitably, after this phase of combat operations comes to a close, the Israelis will have to assume security responsibility for Gaza. There's a lot that could go wrong at that moment. Yeah, I think we should distinguish. Um, the Israelis don't want to run Gaza. They don't want to be the policemen of Gaza. They want to make sure that Hamas cannot govern and cannot attack Israel. So that means uh, having control of the security envelope, if you will. That is the Israeli border, where they're trying to build a kind of buffer and where the United States is quite wrong in arguing that that's... Uh, that should be stopped. It should not be stopped. Uh, they need to do that. And they need, again, to control part of the Egyptian border to prevent smuggling. Um, and they need to be, and they, of course, there's the sea. They need, they need all that to achieve their goals in Gaza. What they don't want to do is to be the policeman on the beat. Somebody else um, is going to have to do that. From the Israeli point of view, that would be a disaster, having to tie down half your army, uh, being policemen from bop to bop. For example, we know now that there is a looting and criminal activity as people try to seize aid shipments that come in. Um, those shipments are needed. Somebody should police them, but not Israel. Elliot, have you been surprised by the level of activity or the lack of activity emerging out of the West Bank? over the last months? Well, there have been a lot of arrests, but um, uh, basically uh, it's been quiet. It's been remarkably quiet in comparison to what people were worrying about it. Kind of gigantic uh, intifada blowing up in the West Bank. I think that is partly because the Palestinian Authority, which is still controlled by the Fatah party, an enemy of Hamas, doesn't want to see that happen. Obviously, the Israelis are there and are trying to prevent it. And there is a question about um, what do people in the West Bank want? Uh, polls show that they want to vote for Hamas. Uh, but in another way, you might say they're voting with their feet or with their hands. They're not exploding. They seem to recognize that, I'd say, given what Hamas did on October 7th, uh, there would be a very quick and tough Israeli response if they did that. So there, uh, this combination of factors, I think, is is keeping it down. Yeah, I mean, I I, I am struck by by the the, as you say, there have been uh, many arrests and there are individual combat operations undertaken by IDF personnel frequently. However, um, given the specter of a conflagration in the West yep. Bank. Um, I have been surprised by that, and um, and uh, that that is an important thing. M moving one's eyes uh, from there northward yeah. to the border with Lebanon, um, I'm I'm afraid that there's less hopeful uh, prognosis. How do you assess the Lebanon border and Hezbollah at the moment? Yeah, I'm a little more hopeful in one way. I do, I did not think I, we may have discussed this on October 9th. I did not think that Hezbollah would cause a major war with Israel. I still think that. Obviously, it hasn't. I think it is not in the interests of Iran, which fundamentally calls the shots. Hezbollah is still their proxy, their second strike capability, their deterrent against an Israeli strike on their nuclear program. And they don't want to lose it, which they would in a major war. So I believe the, the Iranians have told Hezbollah, don't cause that. Now, I think what Hezbollah is doing is, first of all, uh, trying to show that, that you know, it's part of the, or the heart of the resistance, the word they always use. You can't watch the war in Gaza if you're Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, um, and sit there and do nothing because you'd be attacked for it. So I think what they've done is to try to make trouble, try to show themselves as being an enemy of Israel without causing a major war. Problem here, of course, is that what they have done has led to maybe 75,000 Israelis having to leave their homes. That's not tolerable. 
it's been tolerated for these 100 days, uh, getting on to now four months, but uh, it will have to be reversed. And it's going to be reversed in one of two ways, peacefully or not peacefully. I think there is still hope of doing it peacefully, that is, through negotiations, uh, because I, I still think that Iran doesn't want Hezbollah engaged in a major war with Israel. So uh, an accident can happen. The 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah was, in a way, an accident. Um, that is, Hezbollah did not mean to cause that war. It could happen tomorrow. But uh, I'm a little more optimistic about avoiding that and negotiating something. Of course, there's a there's a very dark interpretation of your optimism too, because if one tries to think it through, why would Hamas, uh, excuse me, why would Iran want to preserve that proxy? Well, they'd want to preserve that proxy, of course, because it continues to shield them from potential action while they continue to develop their own nuclear uh, capacity. That has advanced very far, and very few people are talking about it, given all the distractions elsewhere around Israel's border. It's true. Um, I, I would say the Iranian nuclear program, oddly enough, left the stage before October 7th. If you go back to last year, um, it wasn't being talked about all that much. While uh, you're quite right in saying the development of enriched uranium continues. In fact, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, said just in the past few days, uh, Iran is continuing to enrich to 60%. Now, power plants need three or four percent, so there's no peaceful need for this. Sixty percent is enough for a nuclear weapon, though it's inefficient, and people who want a nuclear weapon ultimately enrich to about 90 or 95 <clears> percent. <throat> the uranium stockpile is growing. Um, again, I think uh, you're right in what you said, but I think, you know, one of the things the Israelis concluded after this is after October 7th, is that uh, when people develop weaponry to use against Israel, they will in the end use it or you have to stop them. And so I think uh, the chances of an Israeli attack on the Iranian nuclear program, not tomorrow morning, but let's say over the next couple of years, rose after October 7th. That That is a, a doctrinal shift, perhaps, that um, that we ought to fix in our mind. That whereas before the Israelis uh, were more confident to use the technological means available to them to pursue signals intelligence and try to penetrate the motivations of their adversaries, I think now there's been a shift to look more concretely at capacity, and um, and by by taking the measure of the capacities arrayed against them, to use that as a way as a shortcut to understand what what threats there are. Yes, I mean, one of, you can say it's an intelligence failure. I think one of the things they learned was there's, they have much better intelligence about what um, Hezbollah, for example, can do than about what's on people's minds and what their intentions and plans are. So I, I think it is a significant change in the way they per perceive their enemies. And again, it, it, um, it doesn't tell you what's going to happen in March. But I think it suggests that they're not going to sit there and watch Iran develop a nuclear weapon in 2024, 25, 26. Okay, so I, I'd like soon to uh, for us to move westward and look to Europe and the United States. But before we leave uh, this part of the world, if I were to ask you to now sort of zoom out and zoom back into Tehran and look at the war from that point of view, how do you think it's going? going very well. Um, I've said for the last year or so that if you ask which country has had the most successful <clears throat> foreign policy in the last 10 years in the world, it's probably Iran, uh, as they cement their relations with Russia and China, uh, as they develop their nuclear program, as they enlarge and empower their proxies. Um, we see the Houthis now and the kind of advanced weapons uh, they have. Uh, we see that Hamas was a lot more powerful than, than we or the Israelis thought it was, and so on. So they've had a very successful policy. Now, the war in Hamas, the war with Hamas, um, has um, 
damaged Israel's and the IDF's and uh, the Mossad's reputations, uh, which Iran would like to do. It's killed a lot of Israelis, um, civilians and soldiers, which obviously is something Iran wants to do. Um, it has uh, strained Israel's relations with some of its allies. It's, it's obviously not all positive. When, after the war began, uh, President Biden deployed two uh, carrier task forces and said to Iran and his blood, don't, that is something that obviously Iran did not want to see happen. And it, it doesn't want to see an Israeli-Saudi agreement. And indeed, I think one of the plus things for Iran is that it, uh, it, it, it and Hamas delayed what might have been an Israeli-Saudi deal. It didn't kill it. And that's something that both Israel and Saudi Arabia still want. But from an Iranian point of view, uh, thus far things have gone pretty well. And they've gone pretty well in one deeper way. What you hear the United States saying, the President and Secretary of State now, continually, after there are Iranian proxy attacks is, we don't want a wider war. We don't want a wider war. That is the wrong message. It is absolutely the wrong message. The message we should be delivering to Tehran is, if you kill an American, you will pay the price. You in Tehran will pay the price. That's called deterrence. To say, oh, gee, we don't want a wider war and um, um, we're going to take it out on some proxy group in Iraq or Syria. No, no, no. Uh, in fact, I visited Israel. I have visited twice since October 7th. And on both occasions, Israelis commented to me, Israelis in the government, um, can anything be done about changing that message? It's the wrong message to give Iran. Okay, so... Uh, it is against this backdrop, this arrangement of security, uh, this psychological attitude in Israel, um, this, you know, uh, hierarchy of power in the Middle East. It is against this backdrop that we are somewhat surprisingly hearing a renewed discussion of the two-state solution, and that the very entity which visited this terror and bloodshed upon Israel uh, would now be considered eligible for the unequivocal support of the American administration for something like statehood. So uh, how does one explain that? First of all, what, what, what is the background here? What are the motivations that you think that the uh, administration is is uh, trying to achieve? How, yes, how, how do you explain the resurgence of this old new idea? Well, it is certainly very strange. The Israeli reaction is the logical one. And I really mean the Israeli, not the Israeli government, uh, because we've heard strong statements from President Herzog, former leader of the Labor Party, from Benny Gantz, um, from the entire Israeli cabinet. This is crazy to talk about right now. So uh, your question is a good one. Why are, we, why are we hearing about it? And we're hearing about it from the West. We're hearing about it from the UN Secretary General and the German Foreign Minister and the British Foreign Secretary and the American Secretary of State, and it's, it's unanimous. Um, I think it's partly because they don't have any other idea. They've had this idea for 30 years. Um, in a way, they believe it dates back to the Oslo Accords in the early 90s, which is not quite right. I mean, the person who you know, agreed to those was Yitzhak Rabin, who said pretty clearly that he thought there ought to be a Palestinian entity less than a state, uh, a view which with which I would associate myself. Um, he was in favor of partition, but not statehood. I think what's happened here in the West is people, uh, they don't have an idea. They really don't. I mean, you go back to the State Department and people are pulling out the drawers and going down to the, you know, the what's underneath. Uh, American officials have been saying this for about 30 years um, and have not taken the time to assess whether it's reasonable to promote it now or reasonable to promote it at all. It's, it's ideology, it's dogma, and it has been recycled, I would argue, almost unthinkingly. The Secretary of State 
uh, used the term uh, time-bound, irreversible path to a Palestinian state. Think about that for a minute. That is, we will set a date and nothing will be allowed to change it. No conditionality. Uh, when we in the uh, Bush administration- He said that I, th I think on a visit to Israel. He said it in Israel. And I shouldn't say he said it. He read it. It was in a prepared speech. Compare that to 20 years ago when the Bush administration did the so-called roadmap, whose name was a performance-based roadmap. Uh, performance and conditionality mm -hmm. uh, seems to be uh, being tossed tossed away. I mean, just to spell this out, that, that means that the roadmap operated according to the idea that uh, various various parties and sides had to meet certain criteria along the way. And if they yep. failed to meet those criteria, there were exit ramps preventing the uh, not an irrevocable, a uh, not the uh, glide path toward a state, but glide path toward disaster. Well, one of the reasons I think conditionality is not being talked about much is that the diplomats and political leaders do not believe that the Palestinians will meet conditions that are set. So if you think I have to do something and I have domestic politics, and we should mention that, that I need to care about, I better just say statehood and let's start getting there without uh, reference to conditionality that would slow us down or stop us. And I think if you just give a moment's thought to French politics in a country that's now 20% Muslim and British politics and American politics, people talk about the president will lose Michigan. Domestic politics, I think, is clearly uh, an ingredient here. Yeah, so we, we, I would just introduce that subject like this. Um, looked at from the perspective of the reality in the region, um, it is puzzling to understand how this proposal solves the problems that we see after October 7th. But the way to understand a political proposal like this is to ask who benefits. And uh, the question would seem to be from the Biden administration's point of view, our domestic political fortunes uh, stand to benefit from this proposal. So well, I, I don't I know if that's true. That. I don't know if that's true, but but you should just unpack what you how you understand their rationale. Well, let, let me say there's one other benefit. Maybe there's a political benefit. The other is a benefit to terrorists and terrorism. If Western governments now try to, they are trying to cram down a, a Palestinian state, down Israeli throats. This is a reward for October 7th. It wasn't going to happen if you go back to the beginning of October. Mm -hmm. Now people are saying it should happen. What's changed? A massive, vicious, brutal terrorist attack. I can hardly think of a better reward for terrorism than to say, OK, the real reaction to October 7th will be to force the creation of a Palestinian state. But I'd go back also and say, I think people are not thoughtful about this. What, what's the magic answer? We need a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. By the way, a very American sort mm -hmm. of thought. It's a problem. Oh, we need a solution. We got a solution. Here it is, the two-state solution. Let's do it. Um, without any serious consideration, I've heard none from the US government, of what does that really mean? What are the aspects of Palestinian statehood. What are we talking about when we talk about Palestinian statehood? It's, I mean, in a way, it's gravely damaging to Israel. But in another way, it's unserious. It's it's just a slogan. Well, you wrote a, a, an excellent essay earlier this month in Tablet called The Two-State Delusion. And uh, maybe that the that essay can, can inform our attempt now to try to soberly pick apart just why that's so delusional. Really, what is wrong with the idea of promulgating a two-state solution at this moment? And I suppose the first question I'd ask is uh, what consideration might be given to the previous, re to, to the reasons that such a solution has not come about up until now? It's, it's a good way to, um, to start the discussion. What are the problems? Uh, let's take an obvious one, borders. 
What are the borders of that state? Uh, here's an example. One border question is Jerusalem. Are we really in favor of dividing Jerusalem again? Think about this. Most American tourists who go to the old city go in the Jaffa Gate. Then on your right is the Armenian Quarter. Right there is the Tower of David or David Citadel. On your left is a Christian Quarter. And then you walk through the soup to get, or maybe around through the Armenian Quarter, to get to the Western Wall. So wait a minute. The Muslim Quarter and the Christian Quarter and the Armenian Quarter, that's going to be Palestine? And by the way, is anybody asking the Armenians or other Christians, do they want to be in Palestine? Um, the last round of negotiations on borders, 2008, I participated in. I remember the Palestinian negotiator, Abu Allah, saying, of course, Ariel has to go. Ariel, Ariel is a city of 20,000. So the borders question is a beginning of just noting the problem. Are 200,000 settlers going to be expelled from their homes? Uh, raises another question. Will Palestine have to be Judenrein? Will there be not one Jew allowed to live there? And then you get to the deeper border question, which is Jerusalem, uh, a border question, and of course, much more. So that's first. Then let's turn to the question of, of the one thing the US government says, it has to be a demilitarized state. Well, um, does anybody really believe that? What does that mean? It won't have an army. Okay, it doesn't have an army. It has to have a police force, right? What if the police want armored vehicles? Many American police forces have them. Will they be allowed to do that? Really? What if they want training from Syria? What if they want, what if this new state wants a an agreement of some kind with Iran or Russia, Russia on the Security Council. Will that be permitted? So I mean, here's a very practical question. Um, would this new state right next to Israel have an Iranian embassy? Great question. Great question. It'll certainly have a Russian embassy. If it has an Iranian embassy, just think about the question of <clears throat> diplomatic, what are called diplomatic pouches which are not little, you know, FedEx pouches. They can be uh, 50 feet by 50 feet. What's in them? Nobody has the right to look. Now, you can argue, yeah, but the Israelis will enforce any rules that there are. Once Palestine's a state, any Israeli effort at enforcement is an act of war. How can it cross that border? Stay with Iran for one more second. The idea of a Palestinian state might be a lot more practical if Iran were a free, democratic, peace-loving country. But Iran is a country that is trying to surround Israel with enemies in what the Israelis now call the Ring of Fire, from the Houthis to Hamas to Hezbollah, Syria, Iraq. Um, what's missing? The West Bank. Throw in the West Bank and think of the geography, the, the hills of Judea, overlooking the coastal plain where most Israelis live, where the, most of the economy is, where Ben-Gurion Airport is, where the largest cities are. Um, what a juicy target for Iran to do exactly what they did in Gaza. So you add all of this together and it's, it's I'll say one more thing, that that alone, I mean, is quite striking. People aren't even discussing it. There's one other thing they aren't discussing. What is really the nature of this state and society? Nobody talks about Palestinian democracy. We don't expect the Arabs to because there are no Arab democracies. Okay. Why don't we, why don't the Europeans talk about it? I think the answer is for fear that a democratic in a democratic Palestine, Hamas would rule. Public opinion polls today show Hamas winning elections. Uh, Secretary uh, Blinken has said at one point, you know, we need an effective Palestinian government to give Palestinians what they want. What if they want to kill Israelis? There certainly seems to be, according to poll data, a lot of support for killing Israelis. So how does creating a state dedicated 
as the Palestinian national movement has been for a hundred years to preventing and then destroying the Jewish state, how does that lead to peace in the Middle East? I mean, just, just as an observation, um, in a previous round where uh, some of the Israeli hostages were released in return for the release of many more Palestinian host hostages from uh, from Israeli jails. Palestinian prisoners, not hostages. Excuse me, uh, Palestinian prisoners. Um, I, I happen to notice that in the Jerusalem neighborhoods uh, where those newly freed prisoners were exiting their uh, confinement, they were being greeted by uh, by crowds waving not Fatah and not PA flags, but Hamas flags. And uh, one can simply ask the question, uh, has anyone actually considered that the Palestinians have expressed in poll after poll and, and voting with their feet time after time, year after year, that they do not want a two-state solution? It seems like, I mean, to, to, be, uh, to be a little cute about it, it seems like since neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians want a two-state solution, the only people on planet Earth that want a two-state <laughs> solution sit in the White House and in the capitals of Europe. I think that that's actually true as a historical fact, and it's tragic. That is, the Jewish nationalism that began to develop in the latter part of the 19th century was dedicated to building a Jewish state. Um, the Palestinian nationalism that developed as a reaction to that was never about building a Palestinian state. It was about destroying the Jewish state. Stop the Zionist movement. Stop the Yishuv. Kill as many as you can. And after 1948, obviously 48, uh, the 56 war, the 67 war, the 73 war, um, <clears throat> this goal, which one has to say in fairness, has been abandoned by a number of Arab states in the Abraham Accords and others outside the Abraham Accords, remains unfortunately at the heart of Palestinian nationalism. It's fundamentally a negative, not a positive kind of nationalism. That, that doesn't mean that every Palestinian agrees to that, but um, if, if you look at the polls, which are the best measure we have of Palestinian opinion, why is it that Hamas is so popular? In 2006, uh, Hamas won the parliamentary election. And President Bush's reaction was, well, it's a vote against Fatah corruption, which was certainly partly true. And other people said, no, no it's a vote for Hamas because Hamas is Islam, Hamas is religious, Fatah is secular. But there was a third explanation. Palestinians voted for the guys who said, kill Jews not for the guys who said, well, maybe we should negotiate. Okay, um, th there's one other factor that I don't want us to skip over because it's very important in these negotiations that no one else is talking about or taking seriously as it pertains to the prospect of another Palestinian state, and that has to do with refugees. You're right to raise it, um, the because it, it, it brings into this also UNRWA. Um, I think most of the people who are who are listening to us know the story of UNRWA, that is the only uh, UN agency ever created to prolong a refugee problem forever and to enlarge it in perpetuity. And in every generation, it grows because it is built on the notion that the Jewish state should go away and should be overwhelmed and Palestinians should be there, not Jews. That's the fundamental conception behind UNRWA. Um, the so-called right of return is also meant to overwhelm the Jewish state with millions of, of uh, Palestinians. Uh, there is no right to return. It will never happen. Uh, millions and tens of millions of refugees have been resettled, very largely by the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, in the decades since the Second World War, at the end of which there were millions of displaced people. And of course, after 1948 and the years following, hundreds of thousands of Jews from uh, first from Europe, then Arab lands, resettled. 
the demand for a so-called right of return is a demand for the extinction of the state of Israel. You know, once upon a time, uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Lib Libya gave a speech at the UN, which was laughed at um, because he said, you need to combine Israel and Palestine and, and, and it should be called Israel And everyone thought, well, he's, you know, Gaddafi, he's crazy. You know, half the ideas we see in the newspapers today are no more sensible and are actually quite, actually quite resemble that idea because that's what the right of return is all about. Um, if there were a sensible approach to the Palestinian refugee problem, it would be acknowledged that there are some tens of thousands of Palestinians who lived in what is now Israel and now don't. All of the rest of the 5.9 million people who UNRWA calls Palestinian refugees are not by any other definition, including UN definition, they are not refugees. Someone who was born in Jordan as a Jordanian citizen, to parents who were born in Jordan and are Jordanian citizens, to grandparents who came from what had what is now Israel and got Jordanian citizenship in, in the 1940s by any normal definition except the UNRWA definition. They're not refugees. So uh, one of the things that should be done as we deal with Gaza uh, is, is to end UNRWA and its perpetuation forever of the Palestinian refugee problem. Okay, so having tried to now take it, it to encompass, in our view, uh, refugees, security, borders, the problem of Jerusalem, um, the the manifest expression of Palestinian attitudes towards the two-state solution, the potential for Iranian influence, having to try to encompass all of these things in view. So uh, that is why, for all those reasons, not for any other kind of prejudice, but for all those reasons, <laughs> that is why you think that a Palestinian state is not a material possibility in the immediate future. So let me ask you the obvious question. So... So, okay, no Palestinian state. So what's your solution? What do you want to do? Well, let's distinguish now uh, that question and the Gaza question. There is an immediate question at the end of uh, combat, which may come in a month or two, of, of the governing and reconstruction of Gaza, which is a very serious question. Um, and uh, there are no magic answers here. The notion that the PA can do it, I think, is silly. They have trouble governing the West Bank, and they're not going to be able to govern Gaza. And I do think there needs to be an international effort to build a, let's call it, transitional government of Gaza that will have to include um, Gazans, but fundamentally be the, uh, the major donor countries, including in Europe, the US, and uh, friendly countries in the Arab world. As to the, the broader question, Look, as I said before, um, if there is a problem that has existed since 1948, let's say, or let's call it 1967, since the 67 war, um, and there are repeated efforts to solve it that have failed, uh, maybe we should reach the conclusion that it is not solvable right now, that uh, the most that can be done, and it would be a lot, would be to try to try to bring peace and prosperity to Palestinians. That would be a great achievement. Now, I, my own view of this is, as I quoted Rabin before, less than a state. I am in favor of partition. I think that fundamental idea is right. There should not be one state. What about that entity? Uh, over time, it seems to me that Palestinian entity has to be in a form of confederation with either Israel or Jordan. And my view is that if you look at the logic of this, it won't survive on its own. It's too small and without resources. Does it make sense to be in a kind of confederation with a Hebrew speaking Jewish state or with an Arab, Arabic speaking Muslim state? Now, having said that, I'm sure I'll never get a visa to visit Jordan again, but the price we pay. Um, but let, let, I just want to I just want to unpack what what it means of why an independent statelet is 
not viable from your point of view. And I, when I'm thinking about the factors that go into that, I'm thinking about things like this, like, would that state have its own currency? Would that state have a major international airport? Would that state, what would be the governing institutions of that state? And when you start to ask, not the, the magical incantations of two statism and all yeah. of the, the, the lovely things that that supposedly brings, but you ask the practical questions about how governance is going to work. That is how you're led to the conclusion that federation is a wiser, more practical outcome. That That's exactly right. And you, you've mentioned some of the very practical things. Add security. Um, what about the police and the, uh, frankly, the secret police, the Mughal Bharat? Um, what about the army? Uh, what about protecting the borders? Uh, those are the normal roles of the state, in addition to the ones you've mentioned, which are very, which are critical for the economy. There are answers to those. The Jordanian Dinar and Queen Alia International Airport uh, and, the, and the port of Aqaba and the king and the quite competent Jordanian army and Mughal Bharat. Um, that is why it seems to me that it is much more sensible to view that small entity, uh, and it is small geographically, uh, and again, does not seem to have any natural resources. That is why it would prosper much more and be much more peaceful in the context of what I would call a confederation, mm -hmm. uh, rather than as an independent state. And Gaza is a part of that? Well, not tomorrow morning. I mean, nothing's happening tomorrow morning. I mean, I'm talking about developments over a 10 or 20 year period. Mm -hmm. um, if one could rebuild a peaceful Gaza, if one could destroy Hamas as the Israelis are seeking to do, um, I give you the other precondition for this plan working. It's a big one, the fall of the Islamic Republic. What makes this so very, very difficult is that there is a country desperately trying to damage Israel and support all forms of violence and terrorism in the region. If there were not, if Iran were seeking to promote peace, if, it, if, if a different Iran after the Ayatollahs wanted to join the Abraham Accord, okay, now you can see that Palestinian entity, including Gaza, as a, a much more reasonable prospect. Elliot, we... Uh... We have dozens and dozens, scores of questions uh, from our audience. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, uh, I will try to get through as many as I can here, but you can type your question into the Q&A function of your Zoom screen in the in the bottom corner there. Um, but we already have dozens of very, very good ones. Here's one from, uh, from one of our guests. Uh, what will Ramadan mean for the trajectory of the war, especially when it comes to the potential for escalation in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem? It's dangerous. Uh, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and maybe some maybe some Arab capitals. I think in most Arab states, the governments will try to allow some demonstrations, but will not want them getting out of hand. I think that uh, is true in the West Bank, and uh, we can certainly hope so. It's not in the interest of the Palestinian Authority for that to happen. It is in Hamas's interest, and they'll they'll try. So it is definitely a point of danger, and I, I really hope that some of the really quite irresponsible Israeli politicians who think that this is a great time to go to the Temple Mount um, will be stopped from doing this because uh, there's no there's no sense in creating trouble and danger and violence. Um. So someone writes with a follow-up to, to the last part of our discussion, asking whether there are modern precedents for the proposal of a non-state autonomy confederation model. And if there's any wisdom that can be learned from other kinds of political yeah. experiments like that. I mean, we, we could go back in history and say Austria-Hungary, you know, one king, uh, one army, two prime ministers, two parliaments. I'd give you Kurdistan. I mean, Kurdistan is a is an entity within Iraq. It has a very large amount of self-government uh, within the country, and it negotiates various deals, for example, on oil, with the government in Baghdad. 
maybe that's the closest modern example. Um, okay, this is a question about the the uh, Biden administration and and uh, domestic the domestic dimension of the proposal for a two state solution. This uh, person asks, do you think that the administration really wants to see a Palestinian state? <laughs> or is this almost entirely about assuaging domestic progressive political pressure in an election year? I, I would rephrase that and uh, and just to say, are they cynics or are they true believers? Yeah, I wish I wish I could say I believe they're cynics. Um, but I think there is an element in the administration. It may not certainly not everyone. And I'm not entirely clear on where the president is. Uh, but but the State Department seems to be not cynical, but to have returned to decades of belief that this is a magic solution. In other words, it's probably some dimension of both. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a question uh, about the uh, International uh, Court of Justice. What would an adverse ruling from the ICJ mean for Israeli the Israeli government and the, the war effort? It would be a problem in a number of ways. For example, depending on you know, the exact ruling, but um, for example, Israel does engage in significant economic and arms trade, various forms of weaponry, high-tech stuff, with a number of countries around the world. Some of those countries might, in the aftermath of that decision, feel they needed to cut that off. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think is quite worrying. Others would ignore it uh, as, as they do now, but it, that would, uh, I think, that's what I worry about. I worry about then um, UN sanctions we can veto, but the automatic judgment on the part of a number of governments that, uh, which, you know, have significant anti-Israel caucuses in their parliaments in Europe, the automatic sense that we need to stop doing some things we're doing with Israel now is worrying. You know, it, it gets to a, a very basic question, which I, I probably ought to have asked earlier, but I just thought of it. So let's say that the um, that Secretary Blinken returns to, to Jerusalem and says, Mr. Prime Minister, we're doing it. And I know that your, your Knesset just voted uh, with a margin of 99 to 9 um, against the um, against the uh, the promulgation of a of a unilaterally declared Palestinian state, but we're the United States of America and we're recognizing Palestine. Okay, let's say that that were to happen, what would the what would the international consequences of that be practically? What would change the next day? Um, well, there'd be things that are not all that meaningful beyond the symbolism, though it is significant. For example, a Palestinian embassy would open in Washington and a U.S. embassy in Mala. Now, that faces the Israelis with lots of problems, such as um, can, should Israel allow foreign diplomats to reach Ramallah? It can stop that from happening. Um, what about trade agreements with this Palestinian state that need to involve Israel? Because the Israelis need to permit that trade to move in and out. Uh, what about customs duties? I mean, there's lots of things that that accrue to a state. Uh, Israel is in a position, in a sense, to block the recognition of a Palestinian state from being meaningful on the ground, but that puts them in a confrontation with a lot of other countries that would recognize that state. Um, it, it's so, it is so ripe with dangers that I can hardly believe the U.S. would do it. And there was a step back in the last couple of days um, where Amer American spokesmen were saying, well, we didn't really mean we'd recognize a Palestinian state so quickly. And um, it's an it would be an extremely dangerous thing to do. It would also be very dangerous for another reason. It's dangerous when the greatest power in the world um, acts in ways that are unreal, that do not reflect reality on the ground. Um, there is no Palestinian state. A magic wand cannot create one. So saying, well, we think we've created one is unreal. In, in the Bush and Tony Blair years, I remember Blair saying to President Bush at one point, you know, the reality on the ground has to lead the diplomacy. 
and not vice versa. And that's right. Which would suggest that, uh, very counterintuitively perhaps, but it would suggest that some of the quieter actions that the Israeli government has undertaken before October 7th and in the years leading up to it had done more to advance Palestine, the, the conditions, the preconditions for Palestinian statehood than all of the very loud, effusive, supposedly uh, pro-Palestinian state declarations that we're now hearing. After all, it was yeah. under those Israeli governments and because of those initiatives that the quality of life of Palestinians had risen so dramatically. Particularly if you compare Gaza under Hamas rule with the West Bank, where the Israelis were in a position um, to try to help. I mean, you compare the, the living standards, which, I mean, partly it's because Hamas was dedicating all its resources to tunnels and warfare, not uh, to the people who, who lived there. Uh, sadly, um, since uh, the end of the Fayyad government, uh, about 15 years ago, um, in the West Bank, there has not been a government that was really dedicated to trying to, to build. You know, Fayyad once said, Israel was not created in 1948. It was announced in 1948 after decades of state building, of institution building by the Zionists. And that's right. And that is tragically uh, what didn't happen in the West Bank. Uh, Elliot, here's a question about uh, some of Israel's neighbors. There are questions about uh, Jordan and Egypt's willingness to help resolve the Palestinian issue. Can they be pressured by the Americans to do something more? They can be pressured because we're a big aid giver. And those are both quite poor countries. And we have strong defense relationships and strong economic relationships. There's a limit to what you can do. Uh, Jordan is half Palestinian, give or take, probably a little more than half now. Um, so the king also has internal politics and there are limits to what he would be willing to do. Um, the Egyptians are gonna do what they think is uh, in their national security interest too. Why haven't the Egyptians taken, let hundreds of thousands of Gazans come into Egypt? Because they think it is a national security danger for them. So I think particularly when we're talking about Gaza, we're talking about Egypt. Uh, yes, there are ways for the United States to induce and pressure them to cooperate more with Israel in ways that are in their interest too because having an open border there for smuggling only creates what has happened in Gaza. And that is not, yeah, it's in the interest of a few Egyptian corrupt officials who get bribed, but it's certainly not in the interest of Egypt. Well, we, uh, over the course of uh, the better part of an hour now, have not yet spoken about the hostages. And uh, I'd like to do that. They're, we are not forgetting them in this conversation and no one in Israel is forgetting them even for a second. Uh, what is the best way, and why can't the Americans put more pressure on Qatar? You know, I, as I said, I've made two trips to Israel, and and when you're there, um, hostages the hostages are ever present uh, in the in everything uh, from the main square outside the Tel Aviv Museum of Art uh, to demonstrators to photos of them uh, on so many walls. Um, I think the United States should put more pressure on. There's no question that Qataris have been playing a very clever game, playing both sides for years. And the administration just, the Biden administration just made what I would call a terrible mistake. It just in uh, about three or four weeks ago announced a renewal for 10 more years of the American presence at our airbase in Qatar. The mistake is that it's telling Qatar, look, we're there for you, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked to see, uh, I, I thought we should have done this 10 years ago as well. I would have liked to see us say, we're gonna study it. We're gonna take a look at the alternatives, maybe Saudi Arabia, maybe Bahrain, maybe the UAE. Um, let's see what, just to send the message to Qatar that there are alternatives for us. So I think the timing of what we just did was a big mistake. We can see now that there were massive inflows of funds from Qatar to 
Hamas. And I'm not talking about humanitarian aid that they stole. There was more money than that, I think, that went directly to Hamas. So I would like to see more pressure rather than U.S. officials showing up every <clears throat> month or two um, with bouquets of flowers and saying, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's that. It, look, the negotiations should continue. Um, Qatar has been useful. Others can be useful. I don't think they're absolutely indispensable. The Egyptians, for example, um, have played a role and could presumably play a larger role. The Israelis have a terrible um, conundrum here, um, which is the the, re the relationship between the war and the release of the hostages. Um, is it more likely that the more they prosecute the war and the more danger uh, Sinwar feels himself in, the more likely it is that hostages get out? Or does it work the other way? And you need to stop the war. You need to have a temporary pause to get the hostages out. Maybe Maybe both are true. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't underestimate the, you know, the, the weight that this is on the shoulders of every top Israeli official every single day, because the, the families make sure that they don't forget it for one second. Um, and you read that today, Benny Gantz, for example, said he thought there was a little bit more mm -hmm. optimism. It's just um, a terrible, terrible weight to bear. It, it is a terrible moral and emotional weight to bear. And at the same time, we, we have to acknowledge that uh, that failing to address this problem soberly could well induce the next 139 and and uh, the next hostages to be taken after that. If there's any any uh, any story that Hamas can tell itself, that hostage taking works, then you are going to you are going to damn the next hostages, and uh, and that simply can't happen either. This is a broader problem, of course. We've just seen another hostage taken by Vladimir Putin, um, a, a, a Russian American, um, and we've just passed the hunt, the the one year mark for Evan Gershkovich. So it's it's a it is a true. Um, truly difficult problem. Um, we face it as well as the Israelis, though theirs is a much more acute version of it. Um, I, I don't have any, I, I don't think there are any, you know, magic um, ways out of this. Um, and I think Israelis are, you can see this in the opinion polls and in the conversations you have with Israelis over there. There's uh, a great realism about the fact that some of the hostages are no longer alive, and about the fact that they are not all coming home. Uh, but there is a great longing, of course, to get everyone who's still alive back and before more are killed, as some have clearly been killed. We're we're uh, coming close to the end of our time, Elliot, and so I just want to pose a final question from the audience that has to do with the Abraham Accords. Um, you know. Coming out of the Trump administration into the Biden administration, and we, we, we have to sort of struggle to put ourselves back into the feeling of wind in our sails at that moment and thinking that a brighter Middle East was a borning. And, um, and that may still come to pass in some sense. But how do you see the state of the larger rapprochement with the Gulf states at the moment in light of the war? Um, I think that's something we should be optimistic about. Out of the four countries involved in the Abraham Accords, how many have broken relations with Israel, closed the Israeli embassy, for example, withdrawn their own embassy and closed? None. None. And they've said um, quite clearly, for example, in the case of the Bahrainis and the Emiratis, this was a strategic choice. We hold to that strategic choice, even if we criticize the war in Gaza. Um, the Saudis have said pretty much the same thing. That is, we said we wanted normalization with Israel under certain conditions. We still do. So I, I think there is reason for hope there. I would only add 
you know, uh, they're not doing this because of uh, Israeli tourism. They're doing it fundamentally for their economic interests and their security interests. And they want to be on the side of a strong Israel. And Israel that is prevented from defeating Hamas is a much less attractive Israel to them as they view it and as they view Iran. So if we want to continue this rapprochement between Israel and the Arab world, uh, the peaceful countries in the Arab world, uh, we come back to basics. The defeat of Hamas is central. With that note of, of uh, resolve and defiance, Elliot, thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we adjourn.